Welcome back, everyone, to day two of our symposium on cash transfers. I'm Dilip Soman. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. And along with all of our partners at Ideas42, the World Bank, and the Foundation for Social Change, welcome back. Y yesterday was fantastic. I learned a lot. Uh, and I thought in particular Dean's keynote, as well as the panel on comparing cash transfer and social assistance programs in the global north versus the global south, uh, was really an interesting discussion, a lot of food for thought in terms of how the global north can actually learn from, from the global south. Uh, a lot more to discuss today. We're going to start off with a keynote from uh, Joe Wong, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. We're going to uh, hear a panel discussion on applying behavioral science to the design of cash transfer programs. Uh, and then, of course, we will hear about the Vancouver trial uh, that one of our co-organizers, Jia Ying Zhao, uh, was responsible for conducting. So a lot of that coming up today, as well as networking sessions. Uh, before we begin, uh, as always, I would like to encourage everyone to acknowledge and uh, pay respects to the original occupants of the land on which they work and live, in our case, at the University of Toronto. Uh, that is uh, the traditional land of the Huron-Vendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people from all across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live on this land. Um, before we begin, also a few ground rules that I'm going to just quickly repeat from yesterday. Uh, all of the prepared remarks, the talks and panel sessions will be recorded and shared after the symposium. The uh, networking sessions will obviously not be recorded, uh, nor will be any other informal Q&A type of sessions. Uh, the chat function is uh, our home for sharing ideas, for sharing resources. There were a number of interesting resources that were shared yesterday. We're going to collate all of that and make sure everyone has uh, access to, uh, to all of those links after the symposium. Uh, on the chat window, you will currently see links to today's um, schedule. You will see a link to the bios of all of our speakers for today. Uh, so when we introduce people, we won't get through all of the bios in detail. Uh, as well, you will see a document that's just popped up which says symposium tips and uh, guide for attendees. Uh, just a few quick things on how you can work with Zoom to get the best of your symposium experience. Uh, Questions for any of the panelists, uh, please post them to the chat window. Uh, we will try and get to as many of the questions as we can given time constraints. Uh, but if not, uh, we will make sure we will collate all of your questions and hopefully get them answered by the speaker uh, after the symposium. And as always, if you could just take a moment to ensure that your microphones are off, we would love to have your cameras on. That way we can see each other. Uh, but uh, please do make sure that the microphones are off so that we don't get any hum uh, on, on the line. Uh, speakers uh, and, and, and panel uh, uh, members, uh, you will get a warning bell uh, five minutes before your session ends. And that way, uh, that's cue that it's time to start wrapping up uh, your session. Okay, uh, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce uh, our uh, keynote for this morning, uh, Joseph Wong. Uh, you know, I was on Twitter earlier today because what else is there to do on a morning on a rainy day in, uh, in Toronto? Uh, and somebody was making references to Edward de Bono and I kind of thought about Joe Wong as sort of the academic equivalent of Edward de Bono because he wears multiple hats. In fact, he wears six hats. Uh, Joe is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. He is a professor of innovation at the Monk School of Global Affairs. He also serves as the Vice President uh, International of the University of Toronto. He is an author and obviously an academic. Uh, and then there are two major initiatives that I always associate with Joe. I call Joe the grandfather or the grandparent of those initiatives. One of them is an amazing initiative called the Global Ideas Institute, uh, which brings high school students uh, to the world of political science, to innovation, to 
uh, understand equality to generate innovative solutions to combat uh, some of our major world problems. Uh, and then the REACH Alliance, which is a alliance uh, that started off as a University of Toronto exercise and has now become a, a global alliance uh, of university students uh, that are doing active research in the area of social welfare. And one of the areas that they touch on uh, is obviously uh, cash transfer programs. Um, Joe has written extensively about what he calls the reach problem. And uh, today he's gonna talk to us a little bit about the reach problem, uh, making some references to examples of work that he and his students have done. So without any further ado, uh, Joe, the stage is yours. Take us away. Great, thanks so much, Dilip. Um, first of all, uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, second of all, I'm, I'm very angry that you referred to me as the grandparent. Um, <clears throat> I, I've never thought of myself quite of that vintage yet. Uh, I was actually just celebrating with uh, other folks in my generation, Generation X, uh, and our willingness to be uh, vaccinated en masse with AstraZeneca, which of course is something I hope that all folks uh, uh, avail of the opportunity as soon as you possibly can as we uh, collectively try to combat this pandemic. So, um, so Dilip, I'm a little angry at you for hey, that. Okay. Um, we can- uh, um, Sarah. Can I so um, first, again, thank you so much, Dilip, for this very kind introduction, very generous introduction. Um, and it's really an honor for me to be uh, speaking um, at this particular symposium with this particular audience. Um, the Bear Group at U of T Rotman School is something that I've had the honor of being associated with for many years. Um, and I have a deep admiration for the work of Dilip, his colleagues, and others involved in the bear community. Uh, deep admiration, not only for the rigor and the inventiveness that they bring to research, but always having an eye towards the application of that research, taking those insights, translating them in a way um, that brings us out of the academy uh, and really seeks to have an impact in the real world. And so I'm very grateful uh, to share some of the insights that we've generated at the REACH Alliance, and again, uh, situating them in real world contexts. Um, I should also begin by stressing, I'm a political scientist, and while I engage and I love engaging in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary conversations, my instincts are very much rooted in political science, and, and hopefully you'll get a chance to see a little bit of that flavor as I work through some of the challenges that I know that all of you work through as well. So the REACH Alliance actually began as a very modest academic research project that started probably about six or seven years ago. I happened to find myself in, in Addis uh, Ababa in Ethiopia, and I was there actually doing some research on a totally different unrelated project. But uh, our colleague there um, asked us if we wanted to see where he grew up and we said, sure, you know, we were, uh, we were guests in Ethiopia, and this is a, a country that I'm less familiar with. And so he took me to where he grew up, and it was, as, uh, as we know in many societies around the world, it was what we would call a slum, an illegal and informal housing settlement. And we spent a good amount of time um, where he grew up, met a lot of great people. Uh, but one of the things that I noticed just as a, as a person, as an observant person, was that you know, we were really working our way through this labyrinth uh, and I think this picture here, which is a photo of an, a slum in Mumbai. But as we work through this physical labyrinth, uh, this maze, if you will, uh, our colleague had tremendous intelligence and had tremendous acuity in navigating this slum. But for an outsider, it was completely illegible. And one of the things that struck me was that there were no addresses uh, in this slum. And so I asked, my colleague, I said, you know, there are no addresses here. How does anyone deliver anything? How does anyone get anything to anybody in a slum? And he said, well, folks from around here know how to get their way around, but folks from not around here have a real problem. And so this is what really started getting me thinking as a political scientist. How, you know, and the question was, how do we reach those who are the hardest to reach? And indeed having an appreciation of just how difficult it is 
in delivering stuff, whatever it may be, a cash transfer, in education intervention, a health intervention, or indeed even a vaccine, how difficult it is to deliver things to people who are very, very hard to reach. And this, as you can imagine, appealed to me as a political scientist as I ponder questions around state capacity, government capacity, implementation of public policy. But of course, it was also greatly influenced by the work of Bear and Dilip and colleagues who are focused on the last mile problem. And I've always positioned the work that we do in REACH as being really adjacent to the last mile problem, You know, sometimes referring to it as the second last mile problem, but essentially delivering uh, these interventions to people in order for them to have a choice in the first place. The work that we do at the REACH Alliance is very much set in the context of the SDG agenda. So the backdrop of our work are the sustainable development goals. And I think that SDG number one I very nicely captures what motivates us in our work. And it's quite simply stated as ending poverty in all its forms everywhere. And this is something, of course, as a humanitarian, uh, I admire greatly for its unequivocal nature, ending poverty in all its forms everywhere. But also as a social scientist, I, I really uh, appreciate this axiom because essentially what it means is, is that it's not just about a limit or reducing poverty in some of its forms in some places. Its unequivocalness gives us uh, really distinct measures. We want to reach zero poverty in every single form, in every single place around the world. And so the notion of leaving no one behind is what motivates our work. And if we were to leave no one behind, then it's imperative that we reach those who are the hardest to reach. It's no longer just about reaching the low hanging fruit or even the high hanging fruit. It's actually about reaching the fruit that may even be invisible to us currently. Indeed, when we take a step back and we think about the SDG agenda and we think about the evolution of the SDGs to their predecessor, the MDG agenda, the Millennium Development Goals, when we do take a step back, I think that we can in fact um, um, uh, highlight the great success that the MDGs um, uh, were. The MDGs, of course, saw a world in which we saw greater investments in poverty reduction. We saw the development of public-private partnerships. It's an era in which social innovation and social entrepreneurship become part of our lexicon. We see more and more different kinds of innovative partnerships being formed. And indeed, overall, we see great improvement across the board in terms of measures that we would use to measure progress in the MDGs. But I would also caution that when we disaggregate those numbers, when we take those numbers and begin to unpack them and cut them in different ways, we see, in fact, that the MDGs, notwithstanding their overall aggregate success, uh, leaves us with uh, a great deal wanting. Our colleague Zulfi Buta, for instance, here at the University of Toronto has long pointed out that in two thirds of the countries in which we see improvements in maternal child health outcomes, in overall improvements, in two thirds of those countries, we see growing levels of inequality. The inference being that while on the whole, the country may see improvements in MCH outcomes, uh, that there are many that are increasingly being left behind. A former doctoral student of mine, for instance, did a terrific project on maternal child health outcomes in Chile, which of course is celebrated as a national success case in the MDG context in which we saw an overall improvement in maternal child health outcomes. But when you begin to cut it by region, and now you're looking at maternal child health outcomes by region, she found that indeed in 47% of the regions in Chile, we do see an improvement, but in 41% of the regions, we actually see things getting worse. So the quote here by Tony Lake, I think really captures quite nicely the challenge before us. And that is that when we disaggregate the data, we find that we're in fact masking our national success cases. We're masking these moral and indeed importantly, practical failures. People are being left behind for a whole host of reasons. Consider for instance, that until recently, more than 50% of the population in India do not have formal identification. Consider that in most illegal squatter settlements or slums around the world, housing settlements, there are no formal addresses. Consider that among the poorest in Brazil are people who live in the Amazon Rim in very difficult to reach places. Consider as well that as of 2003, UNICEF estimated that 230 million children around the world do not have their births registered, approximately one third under the age of five leading this Lancet to refer to this as a scandal 
of invisibility. In other words, things like addresses, identification, access to formal labor markets, household registrations, and so forth, these are all what we might call, or at least in political science, we would call the kind of administrative technologies of the state and of the market. These administrative technologies that we oftentimes take for granted help uh, policy and program implementers find, identify, and deliver important things to those most in need. And so the question then before us is how do we reach those who are invisible? How do we reach those who are beyond the reach of these administrative technologies? And as Arjuna Patarai, who's a terrific anthropologist, once put it, that a whole host of local, state level, and federal entities, in other words, government, exist with a mandate to rehabilitate or ameliorate slum life. But none of them in reality know exactly who the slum dwellers are, where they live, or how they are to be identified. And so it's this question that led to the birth of the REACH project and the very first case study, and indeed at the time it was probably in my mind, the only case study we would ever do, uh, was on Bolsa Familia conditional cash transfer program in Brazil. And one of the reasons why I, as an academic, was really attracted to this case was not so much around the debates about the efficacy of conditional cash transfers. Of course, there's a tremendous debate backed by extraordinary amounts of empirical evidence around UCTs versus CCTs and so forth and, and, and whatnot. That was not the debate that I wanted to wade into, but rather what I was most interested in intrigued by the Brazilian case, and I myself primarily worked in East Asia prior to that. So I had very little uh, experience working on or in Brazil. But what really attracted me to the Bolsa Familia program was that it had an extraordinary reach rate in that 75% of the cash that is intended to reach the poorest of the poor actually reached those in the bottom income quintile. Now, by comparative standards, that 75% reach rate is extremely important in terms of minimizing both inclusion and exclusion errors when compared to other similar cash transfer programs in the Latin America region. As you can see here, in terms of the reach rate, i.e. the amount of cash that reaches the poorest of the poor, Brazil really does stand above uh, its comparators in the Latin America region. What more, what's more, I thought was really interesting about the Brazilian case is that this is a country and a society in which we see multidimensional poverty, we see intersectional inequalities, and we also see a state that historically has been relatively inefficient, is known for corruption, and indeed, if we were to put it kindly, known for fiscal leakage. So the question that really drew me to this case was to understand how this was in fact happening. And I gathered together um, five uh, students. Um, I didn't have the time to do the research myself, and, or at least didn't have the time to devote all of my time to do that research. So I gathered together five terrific students, and we together worked on this research project. We worked on uh, secondary research uh, for about a year, um, scoured the literature, both in English and Portuguese, and eventually made our way uh, to Brazil to do some field research. And there we had an opportunity to meet some terrific people, including uh, Bruno Pinto, who is on the call uh, right now, uh, who was with the Ministry of Social Development uh, at the central government in Brasilia. We interviewed people uh, in the government in Brasilia, and then our team split up into two teams, one working in the slums of the favelas in Belo Horizonte, and the other working in the countryside in the northeastern state of Bahia. And here we had an opportunity to not only interview policy designers and policy implementers, but also really getting to the front lines, really understanding what mobile clinics meant, what local community, uh, local committees did, uh, the role of community health workers, and community agents, and so forth. In the end, there are many reasons why Brazil uh, was very successful in its Bolsa Familia program in reaching those that are hardest to reach. But at the core of the success of this program is what's known as the Green Book or the Cadastro Unico, uh, which is essentially a household registry of all low income households in Brazil. And this is, I think, an extraordinary reflection of the information um, collecting capacity of the Brazilian state not only centrally, but importantly, at very local levels. One of the things that struck me, and I recall very, um, uh, very vividly in talking to Bruno and asking about what happens 
when someone lives in a favela in which there are no formal addresses. And when we looked at the database, and of course all private information was redacted, what was really striking to me was that <clears throat> there were physical descriptions of where people live. So in lieu of a formal uh, administrative technology that is an address, there were opportunities for the beneficiary to enter a physical description of where they live and actually a very granular level, uh, very detailed physical description of where they lived. And so in lieu of an actual address, agents of the state or agents of uh, the Bosa Familiar program nonetheless had the ability to identify and reach those who lived in the depths of the very um, uh, densely populated favelas of Brazil. In other words, the reach capacity in this conditional cash transfer program was something that really stood out to us. And as I say, at the, the very backbone of this program was this extraordinary experiment and now very much institutionalized part of the Brazilian state, this household registry of poor um, households in Brazil. Um, we also saw, of course, the use of mobile clinics, something that is now being implemented and quite celebrated here in the Ontario context. I constantly remind my colleagues uh, in the health sector here that this is something that our colleagues in low and middle income countries have been doing for a long time. Uh, we know, for instance, one of the things that was also very impressive about Bolsa Familia is that when a, a person would use the Caixa Bank, which was the banking system upon which the cash transfers are distributed, when they would use the, uh, when they would use the, um, the, the cash machine, they would oftentimes receive a personalized message. So it wasn't just a generic message in terms of remember to do this or, you know, um, uh, you, you, you've received X amount of payments. It was connected to the specific data related to that person saying, just a reminder, you have not brought your child to see a physician yet. Um, uh, you have, you know, you have not withdrawn your cash in two successive months. So very personalized messages to, to effectively nudge the person to remind them of their particular and individual circumstances. So anyway, I want to just stress here that what we saw in Brazil were some real innovations, both at a individual level, but also a system level that afforded uh, the Bolsa Familia program to reach those who are hardest to reach. I uh, hear I show you this boat. Um, this is one of the ways in which cash is delivered to those living in the Amazon Rim and those that are living in difficult to reach places. Now, from a, a North American perspective, this was really impressive. When you talk to people at the MSD in Brazil, they will lament and they will say, well, actually we could be doing better because of banking regulations and security regulations, the boats themselves have to be a certain weight for security considerations, a certain girth. And this prohibits us from actually going further into the Amazon rim and actually delivering these cash transfers even more efficiently and more effectively to those who are the hardest to reach which I thought was a really terrific rejoinder, an important rejoinder to what to an outsider seems like an extraordinary success is a reflection of the, the, the still prevailing gaps uh, within the system uh, in Brazil. So this uh, was essentially the birth of the REACH project. At the time it was imagined as just one case study. Um, and since then the REACH project has now expanded quite considerably. Over the last five years, we've successfully recruited undergraduate and graduate students, including many from the Rotland School uh, and those in, involved in both the Commerce Program as well as the MBA Program, bringing together really passionate, committed student researchers from across the university to work with faculty mentors. And our faculty mentors are drawn from across the university, from medicine, pharmacy, Dalana, Rotman, um, the Monk School, Faculty of Arts and Science, and so forth. And these teams of students and faculty mentors work together in both the desk research as well as then going into the field to conduct primary field research. And over the last five years between 2015 and 2020, we've published 20 plus case studies. We have eight more that we are launching this year. And this work has not only been translated into academic publications featured in places like the Bulletin of the WHO, the British Medical Journal, Lancet, Health Systems and Reform, but importantly, really practitioner focus. Some of our reports have become standard reading in the UNHCR, at UNICEF. We have a really terrific partnership with Global Affairs Canada uh, and so forth. So for any uh, students out there 
uh, as well as any faculty mentors out there who are interested in joining this, please do. And, and as Dilip has noted, we've now created a REACH Alliance and uh, we have partnered with universities around the world. Now, the last point I wanna make, and this is really important from the point of view of a political scientist, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm deeply interested in innovations in service delivery and service delivery implementation, but I'm also interested very much in the political economy of all of this. And once you start thinking about political economy, you start thinking about cost. And one of the things that we look at in our research is how much does it cost the system, if you will, to deliver things to those that are hard to reach? Uh, and one of the ways and one of the measures that we will look at is the total cost. And then when you take the total cost divided by the number of beneficiaries, you have a sense of the average cost. One of the projects that we did a few years ago was looking at uh, vaccine and medical supplies delivery to rural clinics in Tanzania. And we were really interested in not only the delivery system innovations that had been implemented, but we were also interested in how this has affected the bottom line, how this has not only created more effective and efficacious delivery and more equitable delivery of medicines and vaccines, but to what extent has this also reduced the cost to deliver these um, important items to people in faraway places? One of the interesting things, for instance, that we show here two maps that we found was that through the use of geospatial and geomapping technologies, the Tanzanian government in partnership with private sector organizations like Coca-Cola and John Snow International engaged in, a, in an exercise of optimizing the delivery routes and through geomapping technology and GPS technologies created uh, optimized route maps. And we can see here two maps that have been used in Tanzania. The one on the left is the unoptimized one. This is the typical hub and spoke delivery model. And you can see there in the center of the hub and then the use of land cruisers and light trucks to be delivering vaccines and medical supplies to all of the clinics in this very hub and spoke model. On the right, is one that is using the GPS technology to create an optimized route map. And the dotted uh, black line are the use, is, is, is reflective of the use of 10 to 15 ton refrigerated trucks. And through a very orchestrated and very time sensitive, but very orchestrated way, we can see now these refrigerated trucks moving through the Mwanza district and land cruisers and light trucks picking up supplies at designated areas. What this has resulted in has been a reduction in the distance traveled by the trucks of 34%. In the Mwanza district, we've seen average delivery times go from 12 to nine days. We've seen a 35% saving on uh, land cruisers in terms of fuel and personnel, and a total system savings of 14% to the bottom line cost. This is a terrific example of, um, of, uh, of an innovation that has resulted in reduction in, uh, in cost. Now, as a political scientist, I'm interested in questions around total cost and average cost, but I wanna introduce one last variable that's very important, and you can see the political economic implications in a moment, and that's marginal cost. And marginal cost, of course, is the cost of reaching one additional purpose. In other words, the delta of cost over the delta in coverage. And I think this graph here nicely demonstrates exactly what it is that I'm talking about. As you can see here, the bottom axis, the horizontal axis is the dollars spent on the program. So this is total cost. And the vertical axis is program coverage. To go from zero to 20% coverage, we can see that it will cost the system around $2 million. And this makes, total, this makes a lot of sense, right? This is the investment cost, the sunk cost, and the startup cost in creating um, uh, uh, the system or put, implementing the system. We haven't quite reached economies of scale. To go from 20% coverage to 80% coverage, once we hit scale, the total cost increases from $2 million to $6 million. In other words, we are able to increase coverage from 20 to 80% with an additional $4 million. So by the time you're at 80% coverage, the total cost of the program is now $6 million. Here's the kicker. To go from 80% to 90% coverage, requires an increase in total cost of 10 million or an increase or a delta of 4 million additional dollars. And there are a whole host of reasons. Anyone in the field knows exactly why this is. 
we're talking about a much uh, sparser population, there are additional costs, and so on. The point here is that there are diminishing returns after a certain point, and the private sector will tell you that once we see the intersection between marginal gains over marginal costs, they're out of the market. In other words, uh, once we consider marginal costs, we are now building in disincentives to reach those that are hardest to reach. This is some data that we plotted for an article that we published in the bulletin of the WHO. And this is the last slide here. Again, I just wanna demonstrate the red line is the average cost to the system. And as you can see, if we were to draw a line of best fit, the average cost as we extend out to 100% coverage rises very, very slightly. So there's a very, very uh, slight slope to this curve. What's important here is the marginal cost curve. And as you can see, coverage, population coverage to around 50%, marginal cost and average cost pretty much track one another. As soon as you hit 50% coverage, marginal cost starts to rise quite steeply. And as you can see at 75% coverage, in other words, now you're reaching three four quarters of the population, to add one additional per person to that is roughly the marginal cost is two times the average cost. By the time you reach the very last person, which is the aim of the SDGs to ensure that no one is left behind, the marginal cost to reach that last person is three and a half X over average cost. In other words, there is no incentive to reach the hardest to reach. And so the question that I leave all of you and the question that I leave to myself as well as to our research teams is how do we narrow that gap between that exorbitant average cost and the marginal cost as we reach those who are the hardest to reach. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Dilip, and I fear that I've used all my time. Joe, thank you. This was fantastic. I have a lot of questions that actually came in onto my chat, uh, but the, unfortunately, we don't have too much time to get to them. I will ask you one if it's okay, and, and that question has to do with sort of differences in how much of all of this stuff is institutionalized in the global north versus the global south? And yesterday we had John Gesicki, who was here from Kenya, and he was talking about the fact that cash transfer and social assistance is very much part of the government fabric for the way they think about uh, inclusivity. We don't see a whole lot of that in North America. It, it, it's driven by individual researchers, by centers, but not so much by governments. And I'm just curious, uh, your quick observations on why that might be the case and do we think that's gonna change? I hope that changes. And I think if anything, COVID has demonstrated the imperative of changing that mindset. Um, I was listening to this terrific interview with Homer Tien, uh, who is now in charge of the vote vaccine rollout here in Ontario. Um, and he talks, I think really, uh, eloquently about the Operation Remote Immunity, and this is to get vaccines to remote uh, commu northern communities, largely servicing indigenous communities. And he was saying that the two most important factors that contributed to the success of that program, one was uh, leveraging local influencers and leveraging uh, local actors to not only generate the trust that's required, but also the local knowledge that's required to help deliver this. And second was certainty in supply. In other words, a very effective and efficient supply chain or logistics system. And my response or my reaction to that was, well, this is something that we've been thinking about in the global South forever. Uh, this is very much built into exactly what policy designers and implementers think about first uh, in Global South settings. And I think it's a terrific example. I don't know if it's necessarily learning from the South to the North, but there, I think there are definite insights that be, can be gained. The term mobile clinics has become very much part of our lexicon now here in Toronto. Mobile clinics is something that has been used, have been used extensively, and I think done very well in many Global South settings for many decades. Right. The, the bell tolls, I guess it tolls for us. Uh, I am going to ask you, Joe, before we thank you and let you go to do one more thing for us. Uh, be before we do that, uh, to everyone in the audience, a lot of the papers from the Reach Alliance, especially the ones uh, that deal with cash transfer programs, are on the website. So if Liz or Cindy, you could post a link to our resources page. There's some fantastic work. Uh, not just on Bolsa Familia, but in Jordan and Ethiopia, that's all on the website and we can provide you links to the REACH Alliance website as well. 
Our next speaker, Joe, is someone you know very well. It's a project that you know very well. Uh, and so if I may uh, ask you to do a quick introduction to Katie and her team, and then we'll let Katie take us away and tell us about some of the work uh, with M-Pesa. Terrific. I'll, I will um, uh, turn it to Katie as, uh, as quickly as possible. Katie is part of a team, uh, one of our REACH research teams that conducted research uh, with their faculty mentor, Amy Bilton, uh, from the Faculty of Engineering. Um, and they looked at the question of who is being excluded in the M-Pesa cash transfer program in Kenya. And of course, M-Pesa, as we all know in this room, is viewed by many as the darling of uh, cash transfer programs and of innovation to, to facilitate maximal inclusion. What I loved about this project from the very beginning was it was not asking the question that many have asked and answered and that how does M-Pesa reach 80% plus? They want to understand why is that 10 to 20% continuing to be excluded? Uh, and they conducted this research over the last year and a half, employing a variety of methodological techniques. It's a terrific, terrific report. I encourage folks to take a look at it. Uh, there's a paper now that's being prepared for journal publication as well. So congratulations, Katie, and I'll turn it over to you now. And thank you, Joe, for, for your wonderful remarks. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Um, it's currently nighttime here in Singapore because I'm currently in Singapore uh, and I can't guarantee that my dog won't come in and start barking like crazy. So I've actually filled my presentation for you instead. Uh, so I'm going to cast it right now. Um, yeah, and that actually means I'll be free during the presentation to answer any of your questions as well um, if they pop up in the chat. So yeah, just going to share it over here. Perfect. Um, here we go. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are right now. My name is Katie Kwang, and I am an undergrad student currently on a gap year in Singapore. Today, I'll be presenting on some research and a team of students have been looking up at the REACH Alliance over the last year. The title of our research is Left Behind, the Social Economic Barriers to Last Mile Mobile Money Access in Kenya. So into the meat of things, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the concept of mobile money payment systems, which of course are an extremely potent tool in the administration of cash transfers globally. Mobile money payment systems have enjoyed a roaring level of success in Kenya, and PESA specifically represents one of the most successful expansions of financial inclusion in the 21st century. Recent estimates suggest that from 2011 to 2017, the percentage of Kenyan adults who owned a financial account almost doubled from 42% to 82%, and M-PESA is responsible for a very large proportion of that growth. Much has already been said about the decisions and conditions that help platforms like M-PESA achieve its astonishing reach. We also know a fair bit about the specifics of how mobile money-induced financial inclusion has increased welfare. Given that we know so much already about who has M-PESA and why, our team decided to take on the question of mobile money in Kenya from the flip side to try and answer what are the factors that are predictive of individuals not having mobile money in Kenya and what might potentially explain these associations. The data used for the study are cross-sectional data sets from FSD Kenya's 2016 and 2019 FinExis household surveys. We used three models in total, um, a multivariate linear regression, a lasso logistic regression, and a decision tree model to identify predictors of people who do not use mobile money. The linear regression is a descriptive model of correlations in the data while controlling for other variables. The logistic regression is our attempt to build a stronger predictive model and finally, we use a decision tree model to get an idea of how factors may play into each other and also to begin to understand customer profiles. So we have pretty robust accuracy scores above 75% for non-mobile money users and around 90% for mobile money users. As expected, we have a lower accuracy score for non-mobile money users because there are proportionally fewer examples of these um, individuals in the data set for us to train on. So the first and most consistent findings of our models may appear at first to lead to a rather obvious dead end of a conclusion. So as you might expect, we found that lacking a phone and government ID are the two most significant factors associated with being a non-user of mobile money across all of our models. You would expect this since having a phone and government ID are two out of three of the prerequisites required to register for a mobile money account in Kenya, the third being a SIM card of the telco that the mobile money system belongs to. 
So we followed this finding, it would transform the question of who isn't using mobile money into a question about phone availability and the challenge of ID registration. But what if we invert the finding instead, and we ask another question, which is, how is it possible at all for someone to use mobile money if they don't have a phone or ID? How many users fall into these groups of users? So within our data set, we found that 6.92% of mobile money users did not own a phone or a government ID, and the existence of these users suggests a more complicated reality. We can begin to piece together the puzzle if we stick with the question, how do Kenyans use mobile money if they don't own a phone or have ID? The first clue lies in Kenya's exceptionally high phone ownership rate, where 79% of adult Kenyans own at least one mobile phone. This obviously isn't 100% though, so what if we take one more step back and we look at phone access instead? So we know that as of 2016, 93.1% of Kenyan households own at least one mobile phone. So beyond personal ownership, many Kenyans actually have access to phones within their peer groups or family units. Another possibility is account sharing, which has to be the option by default for those who don't have ID, since they wouldn't be able to register for their own mobile money account. We weren't able to find any literature on the prevalence of account sharing among mobile money users, but within our own data set, we found that 2.21% of mobile money users did not have government ID, implying that they had to be using someone else's accounts for their own transactions. So in review, traditionally and overwhelmingly, to use mobile money in Kenya, you would need a phone, a government issued ID, and your SIM card. But actually, maybe not really, because if you're a phone sharer, maybe all you really need is temporary access to a phone and your government ID and a SIM card. But even then, actually, maybe you don't need anything at all, because actually, if you're sharing an account with someone else, you never really need to register for your own mobile money account. So you don't even need a phone, ID or a SIM card. So in an ideal world, our team would have been able to go to Kenya and speak to stakeholders, and we would have been able to get narrow data sets to illuminate this sort of unexplored niche in our understanding of mobile money use. But we live in a pandemic reality, so to understand the precise breakdown um, and relationship of account sharers and phone sharers, a dedicated mixed method study is obviously required. We can't know for certain the significance of this group until we've really properly looked into it. However, I want to put forward two other pieces of evidence that suggest to us that non-traditional mobile money users shouldn't simply be dismissed, and that they actually have something really important to say about our understanding of reach and mobile money. So the first figure of interest is phone churn. Uh, Kenya has an exceptionally high rate of phone churn. Phone churn refers to how frequently users change phones, and we know that it's really significant among rural users due to a wide variation in the quality of phones that are available. Uh, many of these phones include counterfeits or even third or fourth handsets. The second figure of interest refers to the SIM penetration rate, uh, which refers to the number of SIM card subscriptions per 100 people. So the most recent estimate, I think done in 2020, uh, found that the current SIM penetration rate in Kenya is 126, which means that at the very least, 26% of the population has more than one SIM card. So this is motivated in part by a desire from savvy consumers to take advantage of the favorable rates that different telephone companies have for different products. So these two figures put together, paint together a culture of very frequent phone sharing and SIM switching, which isn't really much at all like the understanding that you and I might have of phones and mobile money, where we usually have one phone for a longish period of time uh, with one number where all of our mobile money accounts are linked to that one number. So I've obviously spent a lot of time on this thought exercise, and the purpose of it really is to show that ID and phone ownership aren't necessarily the insurmountable stop points to mobile money use that we thought them to be in the first place, but ultimately also to show that Kenyans can and have employed a remarkable level of dexterity and creativity in gaining access to mobile money. And so mobile money may actually be a lot more accessible than we think in different ways um, in Kenya. So this begs the question again, and it's actually the same question that I started with, which is that given that mobile money may be a lot more accessible than we think, who isn't using mobile money, and why? Our research points to three possible areas that should be explored with more precise data sets and qual work. So the first is with regards to location. So the map on the screen here is a visualization of the location of mobile money users and non-users in the data set. As you might expect, urban counties like Nairobi and Samburu have fewer um, non-users than rural counties such as Takana. 
However, our addition of county dummy variables to early versions of our linear regression did not show consistent trends or lead to improvements in classification. We used eventually um, population density as a proxy for urbanicity instead in our final model, uh, and we found a significant but ultimately very weak association between population, population density and mobile money use. So in reviewing both approaches, we concluded that the issue is that population density data and county dummies cannot really capture variations in more granular factors, such as agent proximity, electricity, and road access, which are likely stronger predictors of mobile money use and should be a priority instead for future uh, quant studies. We also find that education is another influential factor. So lacking um, any form of education is associated with around a 13 to 17.5% decrease in one's likelihood of using mobile money within our data set. We have core studies, for example, um, that give us a more precise illustration of how a lack of education can inhibit mobile money use. So for example, uh, the researcher Susan Weish and her colleagues have done a lot of work looking at the experience of Kenyan women and farmers as they interact with mobile money. An example of the challenge that users can face is the UI and UX of mobile money apps. For example, M-Pesa doesn't have a uniform interface or experience across different handset models. So in rural areas and for groups for whom phone churn is significant, that is, where they're frequently changing their phone from month to month or even week to week, this requires them to relearn the app each time and they can't educate each other. So the finding also helps to set into context other factors, which we found not to be significant within our model such as gender and urbanicity, which are significant but weak correlates to mobile money use in our data set. It's not that these factors don't matter, but rather it's likely the case that the spread of mobile money in Kenya has become so plural, um, it's become even more intersectional, and education likely interacts with these other factors in complex ways. We also realize that language and ethnicity may also be another factor that is complicating mobile money use. So while datasets didn't explicitly collect information on ethnicity, participants were required to choose a preferred language to have the survey from, from a limited range of options. So most participants opted for English or Swahili, making the language preference variable an imperfect proxy for ethnicity. Despite this, however, we found several results that were significant and strange enough that we think they invite further investigation and we've mentioned them in our final paper. For example, one of them include uh, one of them is uh, in 2015. For example, we found that participants who chose Somali for the interview language were significantly less likely to use M-Pesa, a trend which was sustained throughout all three of our models. In 2018, however, this trend entirely disappears. So while it's possible that findings like this um, are an artifact of sampling, we want to draw attention to this factor because we believe it has renewed relevance uh, right now to mobile money and ID access in Kenya. There exist significant ethnic differences in ID possession in Kenya. A 2013 report by the Kenyan Human Rights Commission states that the process of vetting Kenyan Somalis, Nubians, and Kenyan Arabs for ID cards is discriminatory and violates the principle of equal treatment. In 2019, Kenya began a nationwide push towards the assignation of a unique biometric ID for each citizen. And so we expect this push towards biometric ID to exacerbate these existing inequalities in ID use. So given the essential importance of government ID to mobile money, examining the link between ethnicity and access should be of primary interest to future researchers in this space. In light of our findings, we discover ultimately the limitations of our initial premise of a reached and unreached binary. By framing all non-users as unreached, we presume that they do not have access to mobile money uh, when there actually exists a second possibility, that they do have access, but they are simply self-selected out of mobile, out of being a mobile money user. So instead, um, we propose a new set of definitions or a new set of categorizations to understand mobile money users um, in our data set and in the study. So users can be reached and unreached, uh, and by unreached we refer to non-users who could conceivably benefit from using the intervention, in this case mobile money. And while it may be deeply counterintuitive and challenging to imagine persons whose lives would not benefit from using mobile money as is, we can't actually rule it out, uh, and we don't really know how significant this group is because of the lack of research. So it may even be helpful to subdivide this group of non-users again, and so we can recognize non-users for whom a feasible change in the intervention could compel them to use the product, and a final group of non-users for whom no reasonable intervention could compel them into using the product. So examples of such non-users could include the elderly, for whom the cost of learning how to use their cell phones may simply not be justified by the marginal benefit of using mobile money.
Future work should be dedicated towards the study of the motivations, priorities, and behaviors of a typical mobile money users and non-users, because it might actually reveal to us that mobile money has actually achieved an incredible level of reach already, um, and the final subset of users may not necessarily actually benefit from using mobile money. And to conclude, uh, just to give a sense of the people who work in this project, so I work together with three other extremely talented grad and senior undergrad students at the University of Toronto to produce this paper. Um, here's a picture of us at last year's REACH Symposium. So from left to right, that's me, uh, Miriam, who's currently a consultant at BCG, uh, Zach, who's currently working at the Creative Destruction Lab at U of T, and Kevin, who's wrapping up his master's in development econ at Yale. So I'm just gassing all of them up on their behalf because all of them are brilliant, but they all have daytime jobs and they were not able to make it for this conference. Uh, our project is supervised by Professor Amy Bolton and Ahmed Mahmoud of the Center for Global Engineering at U of T, and I believe they're in attendance today. And our project, of course, is housed um, in the REACH Alliance, which is a student-led, faculty-driven, multidisciplinary research initiative dedicated to investigating the pathways to success for development programs that are reaching the world's most marginalized populations. REACH is housed at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy with support from the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. So on behalf of our entire team, a massive thank you to you for listening to our ideas. We hope it was helpful to you in some way. Um, if you're interested, please keep an eye out. Uh, we hope to be publishing this paper sometime in May. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out uh, at katie.kwang at mail.utoronto.ca. And once again, thank you. Katie, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, amazing work. A lot for us to think about, especially people that are designing cash transfer programs because we talk about the last mile challenges, but obviously the second last mile is, is important. So thank you for that. Uh, and we'll make sure we will send questions your way. Uh, before moving on, I, I do want to acknowledge that all of this work was done by four undergrad students. And I think about myself when I was a college student, uh, you guys are inspiring. So thank you so very much. Uh, I'm now going to turn to uh, our next panel, uh, and, and I'm going to welcome Rinos Wakis to uh, kick us off. Rinos is the lead economist uh, in the poverty and equity global practice at the World Bank and is a fantastic collaborator, uh, part of the Embed, the Behavioral Science Program at the World Bank. So Rinos, take us away. Thank you, Dilip. Um, I will say the one thing that uh, Zoom conferences have is they completely destroy my ability to make any joke that works. So I will not do that. Uh, but let me jump us into this very exciting panel uh, where we kind of try to do a dive into the details of what exactly can behavior science uh, can really help, you know, fine tune, complement uh you know cash transfer schemes around the world uh and uh for that we have a very exciting panel um you know i'll um, I, I will just introduce them very briefly and uh, you have the biographies to see all the amazing collective work that they've been doing but we're gonna hear from lisa Janetian, who is uh, at the sanford school of public policy at duke university uh, she works a lot on early uh, early childhood uh, work uh, in the U.S. We have Joel McGuire from Happier Lives Institute, where he's gonna bring us some of his insights from the meta science uh, kind of a, a meta analysis work about about program effectiveness. Uh, we have Frank Schilberg from MIT, uh, who basically uh, combines behavior science and development economics. And he's going to tell us a lot about his work around mental health. And finally, we have Laura Rawlings from uh, the World Bank, who has uh, years of experience applying, uh, you know, concepts and, 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 uh, and, and real, you know, policy work uh, around the world uh, in the social assistance, cash transfer, et cetera. Um, so this session, it's uh, gonna we're gonna try to have a conversation uh, and uh, feel free to put any comment and uh, question on the chat, and we'll try to get to it as we go around. So, without kind of a uh, wasting time, let me just jump into uh, and let's start with Lisa. Um, you know, we when one thinks about uh, you know design features to improve you know cash uh, transfer schemes. Uh, you know, a lot of your work in the US, you know, has been focused on how to help parents make uh, better decisions. So 
Uh, what can you tell us about the role of behavior science specifically when, when we want to kind of think about, you know, design considerations to support parents? Thank you, Venus. Thank you for the introduction. Nice to see all of you again on the panel today. Um, so let me start by saying that the U.S. does not have a deep history, as everyone knows, of actually um, allocating cash transfers or cash gifts. You can use all the language you want directly into the hands of um, people. What we do have is a very cobbled, uh, diverse system of uh, safety net programs, and most of those are conditioned on some kind of behavior, work being one of them, or they're restricted to purchase certain types of goods. Um, food being another example. Um, and so the way that while these are sometimes described as anti-poverty initiatives, particularly alleviating child poverty, um, they differ quite a bit from almost anything else that's being, I think, discussed in these last two days um, in, in the way of describing a true um, kind of basic income or unconditioned cash um, type of program. So what we've learned about parents um, and programs in the US largely comes from something I would call direct child kinds of services, right? So these are early childhood interventions um, or similar child targeted types of programs. Um, and this is the area that has sort of a body of work um, and scholars um, that are applying behavioral science kind of insights um, and blending that with child development and blending that with economics and social psychology. So what that behavioral science work is really cracked open, this is going to feel a little obvious, but I think it's really important, especially in the US context, is that parents actually parent in the context of many other things going on in their lives. Um, this is not conventionally an assumption, for example, that child developmentalists who design many of these child targeted interventions come with. So recognizing that they're workers, they have relationships. Um, they need to find places to live. They need um, to figure out how to keep their children safe in addition to kind of educating and being kind of their parents' first teachers. Um, so that's sort of, I think, one thing that is really um, cracked open um, insights in this field in the US um, about parents and parents' decisions. Um, and the next is that we don't always have to do really big things to support change favorably. Uh, for children's development. So it's the combination of we can do small design things um, and we can do this in the context that recognize parents' full lives um, that you know, have been kind of at the frontiers um, here in the US. So with that as a premise, I just wanted to lay out a couple of things that kind of feel exciting to me, right? In this world of developing programs that can support families, whether they're cash transfers or direct services. One is to really think hard about defaults and the way that we design choices. So the presumption in the US is that everything should be voluntary. The government basically should not be in the, in the um, business of making decisions for families. And this has had some spiraling, I think not so favorable consequences. Um, if you think about the scenario I just laid out where we're, parents are juggling a lot, you add unstable economic resources, the bandwidth demands are gonna be enormous. And now we're asking them to make active decisions, right? And to assess and digest information, to follow through on benefits and programs and services and make good decisions every day on behalf of their children. Um, so thinking about how to automate some of that, how to make it more opt out rather than opt in, how to build in more active choice kinds of scenarios, um, I think is one of the early lessons coming out in the context in which it's been tested. Um, the next is it's really hard to calibrate benefits, right? Um, when we do small things like actively speaking to our children when they're infants, they're not actively speaking back. It's hard to have a conversation. It's also hard to convert that into a long-term benefit. And so um, there's some really good work happening with colleagues uh, at the University of Chicago that really shows that um, kind of bringing the present benefits, bringing to the present future benefits um, can be quite powerful for parents. Um, and there's been some really good um, research to support that. The third is, um, you know, unlike the philosophy of cash, which is enabling and trusting that people know what to do, what's best for them with their money, um, early childhood and related types of um, programming in the US kind of has an opposite philosophy, which is we know what's good for you. Um, and that in turn puts a lot of demands on parents and also um, 
puts them in a position of engaging with the system in which they already uh, feel like they don't have the capacity to do what's good for their children, right? So it is this um, a potentially negative um, stigmatizing way of approaching parenting. And there are things we can do kind of unravel that and embrace everything good that, cap that parents are capable of doing. Um, and then just the last two quick points, and then I'll, I think I'm done with my four minutes. Um, one is um, uh, the second to last point is, you know, we've focused a lot on information education and curricula design and content design. And even when I mentioned some of these light touch approaches, those um, are even delivered in a very content heavy based way. And as a, my uh, evolutionary biology um, psychologist, uh, colleague Alison Gopnik reminds all of us when she talks about the gardener versus the carpenter in terms of children's development, we've lost a little bit of sense of the importance of play and fun. Um, and so, you know, I think there's some small uh, momentum to reintroduce fun and that fun can be in, in the best interest of the child here, right? We can achieve those goals of economic security and education. Um, and then my last point, which I think came up earlier this morning in some of the conversations in um, other areas of the world, is um, I think there is a tension between personalization, which we can do through algorithms and again, automation, and trust, which is a very human experience. And I think this is uh, especially important um, when it comes to parents. Um, and so I'd like to see us kind of explore that tension and that theme as we continue the conversation today. Thanks, Lisa. I, I, and I think especially this last point on uh, you know humanizing yeah. interventions. I think it's a great uh, it's a great insight. Um, I guess I'll I'll turn to Laura. Uh, you have you know worked in an abundance of developing settings, uh, doing similar uh, you know work. Uh, what uh, what are what do you find are notable similarities and differences uh, that you see across the world? when one tries to apply behavioral insights to, you know, cash transfer schemes. Um, from what, you know, Lisa kind of uh, elaborated from the US insights. Great, thanks Renos and, and thanks Lisa and thanks to everyone um, for putting this conference together. It's a great opportunity to share experiences. Um, so obviously the developing world is vast and vast experiences compared to what's going on in the US. Um, but, uh, but I will say just on Lisa's comments, I think in the US, what's very uh, exciting is actually to see that we are about to launch into um, some new cash transfers and very much focused on parents and, and addressing child poverty. So I think there's a new chapter in the US. Let me just say that before launching into what, what's been going on in developing countries. So this is a, a vast field, but um, what's interesting is that actually cash transfers are among some of the most well-evaluated interventions uh, in, in the development world. So there's actually quite a bit that we know, and it's, they've also been evolving very rapidly. And I think if we, if we look back on kind of the earlier models of conditional cash transfers that Reynos worked on, that I've worked on, that many of us worked on, particularly in Latin America, you had this kind of, um, you know, cash transfers 101 model, which was very much based on conditions, very much based on also a context with available supply side services. And so it was this rather um, predetermined design model that was essentially the classic model focused on insisting that parents um, enroll and take their children to school and make sure that there's attendance and following up on, on essentially well baby checkups and, um, than going to some training sessions, but they've really evolved a lot since then. Some of that has been by necessity and some of it has been by design. So by necessity as cash transfers have been introduced in places that don't have all those available supply side services, one had to simply adjust what was conditional and what wasn't. But then there has been a whole advent now of cash plus models and labeled cash transfers that have really been much more mindful in terms of introducing behavioral uh, interventions and behavioral insights and, and how they're being rolled out. And the exciting thing 
is that we're now actually starting to get some really good evidence around this. And we have a number of countries where you have um, particularly randomized control trials that have looked at different um, treatment arms and introducing um, behaviorally oriented interventions on top of the cash to look at the value added. And what we're finding in short is that um, there are some very cost-effective uh, interventions uh, that focus very much on parents and parents' behaviors because a lot of the idea behind cash transfers is not just sort of supporting um, income today and smoothing consumption, but the, the premise and the promise is that we will improve human capital outcomes and that particularly through investing in children, it's an important way to provide that foundation for human capital development. And eventually the hope is actually break intergenerational cycles of poverty. So it's very um, important in, in the design to look at, at these parenting interventions. So let me um, quickly just <clears throat> review a few things. Um, so in, in the cash plus models, uh, one, another element that's very important is that these are often focused and targeted on uh, families with children and also often um, on uh, low income or vulnerable families where you tend to have higher uh, initial human capital deficits. And what we've learned, first of all, simply from cash transfers and that whole literature is that already there, are, there is evidence from Ecuador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Reynos, your work, Mexico, that there can be impacts on uh, child development outcomes, including cognition, including language, other child development outcomes, simply from these cash transfer models. And of course, we also know that um, some of the parenting interventions, um, uh, and this is work by um, Aboud and Yousafzai, who did a review of all of this, um, show that parenting interventions, um, even above and beyond nutrition interventions, because they looked at those as well, can have rather important effects on cognitive outcomes among children, whereas the nutrition ones predictably have more of an impact on anthropometric measures. But what's very interesting is then to look at this literature and these experiences coming out, and I'm about to wrap up, um, where you have these, uh, uh, where you have the behavioral interventions that are layered on top of the cash transfers. And there, um, uh, we did a review fairly recently looking at the experience in Colombia, Mexico, Niger, and Peru that all had randomized control trials looking at these parenting interventions. And we found in um, all cases except Niger, um, in important impacts on cognitive uh, and language uh, among children. But in Niger, even though there were not those measures, there were um, important changes in practices, particularly um, around uh, nutrition and, and health and exclusive breastfeeding. And what we found recently in Madagascar is a very interesting work actually with Ideas 42 on the role of norms and mothers supporting each other, these mother leader groups that have an impact above and beyond the cash transfers and that those are enhanced even further when you introduce behavioral nudges around self-affirmation and planning. So very importantly that way. And then let me just end by referencing some recent work that um, Pedro Carnero and others have been doing in Northern Nigeria where they're actually beginning interventions in utero, which seems very promising and who have concluded uh, through their work there that there's a key role of information and practices that are leading to um, a range of outcomes, including long-term outcomes um, uh, among, among women and, and children. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. And I, and I think you're, you're also you know, alluding to you know, something that I think has been coming up in, in this conference is that, you know, on one side, one can think of um, kind of the, the choice architecture, kind of the, the you know, the, the match space of design features. Uh, while on the other hand, a lot of what we're finding 
uh, in cash transfer schemes is how they actually may, may directly or indirectly change um, you know mental models very kind of specifically and 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 and, and it's a nice uh, so so I'll, I'll turn to Frank now uh, who has actually have thought a lot about you know the space of mental health and the you know this this area of you know coming from the psychology of poverty thinking about through the lens of you know uh, you know how you know kind of aspirations and and forward you know kind of a forward looking kind of behavior uh, to hear a little bit from your own work, uh, you know what um, you know. What are we finding about the role of you know kind of mental health? Uh, men, you know, what's the way forward in terms of integrating kind of these features into cash transfer schemes? Uh, uh, thanks so much for 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 having me. Let me focus on two main points based on some of my recent work in India. So um, we have recently studied some of the, or tried to study some of the economic benefits of improving financial well-being uh, in terms of worker productivity. These are not really cash transfers, but more sort of mechanism experiments, if you want. And so, you know, one key finding here is that small differences in design can have really important um, consequences. And, and let, let me give you an example. So in a recent experiment um, on the effects of financial strain on worker productivity, um, we study how paying workers a few days earlier uh, than others uh, may affect their productivity. So these are workers who are uh, financially severely strained. This is in the lean season when they're strapped for cash with very few opportunities to earn money. People have lots of debt, et cetera, and sort of, you know, this is a great opportunity for them. Usually workers are paid at the very end of this pay period. And what we do in this experiment, we um, uh, pay some workers earlier than others um, by surprise. And um, the main or the key result here is, which I think is an important one, is that, you know, paying workers earlier, uh, in fact, makes them uh, significantly more productive uh, in their sort of small scale manufacturing work. So this is like a real work uh, world work task. Um, uh, and, you know, this suggests that psychological factors such as worries, sadness, et cetera, um, can not only make people unhappy and, and uh, uh, affect people's well-being, but really meaningfully interfere their work and sort of their capacity to be economically um, resilient. Now, in addition, and this is the point that, that I'm trying to make, uh, uh, that I want to make is, um, we don't find any announcement effects. What do I mean by this? When you tell workers that in a few days you're going to be paid earlier than others, nothing happens. So essentially telling people that they be paid sooner does not affect their productivity. It really just matters whether workers um, have money in their pocket actually. So once you pay them, once you give them the money, they have cash in hand, they're able to pay their bills, et cetera. Um, uh, workers become productive. Three days earlier, when you tell them like in three days, I'm gonna pay you, which you might think you know affects uh, 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 their worries and strain as well. We find no effects um, uh, uh, whatsoever. So I think, what does that tell us? Well, when workers are really financially strained, um, delivering cash quickly at times when people are really are in need uh, uh, can be extremely important. Now, of course, one needs to think about sort of the impl implications for sort of real world policy uh, 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 settings, but I think really understanding being flexible and uh, figuring out when people are really financially strained and figuring out when um, uh, people need uh, uh, support the most, of course, uh, uh, especially in times of COVID, is really, really important for sort of their capacity to, to or supporting their capacity to help themselves. Um, the second point I want to make is, and this is getting more into like mental health, is that um, we should, uh, you know, there's a large body of work that's now shown that cash transfers can improve uh, psychological well-being, including mental health. Um, but we shouldn't expect cash alone to do the heavy lifting in terms of addressing severe mental health issues, especially uh, such as anxiety or depression um, disorders. And so in particular for the subsample of people who are um, affected by these conditions, which we can actually measure relatively easily these days, um, it's likely cost effective to offer at least some form of psychotherapy as well as sort of supplementing perhaps these, these cash transfers. Um, why is that? Well, um, uh, uh, inexpensive versions of psychotherapy, such as, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, such as implemented by uh, Sangat or other really inspiring uh, NGOs in India, 
um, often involving non-specialist counselors, um, have been found to be highly effective in terms of um, improving mental health at very, very low costs. And so now studies are also beginning to show some positive economic effects. And so putting these things together, um, uh, uh, supplementing cash with mental health support, at least for some populations who are particularly affected by mental ill health, is likely a very, very good idea. And I think we should try to explore, uh, explore that more. Thanks, Frank. Um, I'll, I'll turn to Joel now and, and in some ways uh, probably give him the hardest question of the session because I, I think, you know, the, the holy grail of everything is, you know, does do things, you know, what works and, and, and you know, how to scale, etc. But uh, you are doing a lot of work uh, on, on thinking about cost effectiveness of different types of programs addressing poverty. So uh, just wanted to, you know, hear from you know what you're finding in terms of you know how do cash transfer schemes you know compare with other types of intervention but also try to think through you know all the the things we've heard so far in terms of what is the you know the value added potentially of behavior insights uh in in in, in the cash transfer kind of schemes uh that that we're finding that are particularly effective and attractive Yeah, thank you, uh, Rinas. Uh, it is a it is a very tough question. So I'll start with trying to explain, you know, cost effective in terms of what. And so my work is a little bit odd in that it's um, it kind of you know tries to do this marriage with philosophy, where we say, okay, well, what's our best guess of you know what what does measure well being? Because I think well being is you know, really what a lot of us are after, even though, you know, we'll specify it in very different ways, you know, from feelings to getting what we want to, you know, like fulfilling our capacities to, you know, fulfilling our values. There's a whole, you know, different ways that, you know, this can be specified. But we, you know, we try and, you know, um, you know, just to take the guess that, you know, we can ask people how they feel and they'll, you know, they can kind of give us coherent answers to, you know, how they're doing. And we can use those as measures of well-being. And, you know, we call these, we just call the subjective well-being, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, but um, kind of, you know, with what Frank was talking about, this this question of mental health is, is probably very closely, you know, related to subjective well-being. So um, in some of my work, you know, I even use in this proxies. If you hear my dog whining, I'm sorry. Um, so that when when I'm saying you know when I do things in terms of cost effectiveness, this is this is what I'm looking at. So cash transfers, when we look at the recipient alone, don't appear to be you know the most uh, cost effective means of improving or saving lives, which are kind of different, which have different philosophical kind of like infrastructures behind them, improving or saving lives. That is, but um, if we expand our circle of consideration to encompass the household of the recipient, so not the recipient alone then I think cash transfers actually become one of the most promising interventions that exists. Um, that's, I, 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 think, I think it's possible, but I'm, I'm not quite sure because there's just a, a huge absence of, of good data on you know, what happens to um, kind of like the household. And so we, we often don't kind of measure the effects of you know, cash transfers or any intervention in the same units across every household member. You know, we may, men, you know, we may measure maternal depression, and then we may measure, you know, some sort of childhood functioning. Um, so, you know, we can't, you know, ideally, you know, we would have, you know, we'd be able to see, you know, kind of, um, you know, amongst everyone, you know, what, what, what happens, what are kind of the household general equilibrium effects. And so this is, this is really relevant because when we get into kind of these uh, key behavioral questions, uh, such as, you know, do we add conditions or do we not add conditions? Because when we add conditions, um, in the meta-analytic, you know, like analysis I, I've done, it appears that, you know, adding conditions makes the recipient a bit less well off. Um, they just aren't, you know, as happy. They don't think their, life is, their lives are going as well. They feel a little bit more depressed or sadder. Um, then, they other, then the people who, um, um, who have no conditions, so they, they still, they're still better off in, in general. Let me make that clear. Um, but they're just not as well off as those without conditions. And that just may be, you know, the stress of having to fulfill the conditions I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure. They're, they're, and, and this isn't a very, you know, robust finding. Um, 
but I, I think that, you know, just kind of uh, reinforces this point that, you know, conditions do change, you know, behaviors though. And so what we really want are these household journal equilibrium effects, which are so far, all there's, all, although there's, you know, immense evidence on cash transfers in general, um, you know, we, we, we still, there, there's still, I think, a lot of progress to be made, you know, in, in behavioral, um, you know, science and in, you know, like looking at these interventions of, well, like for the whole household, is the whole household better off, um, you know, an expectation, you know, when we have these, when we have these conditions. And so I think, you know, conditions, uh, you know, to me are still kind of this, this unresolved, unresolved topic. Um, and yeah, if I have, I guess to further kind of, um, you know, m motivate why this household question is so interesting and why it is so, why it is, you know, potentially uh, for the household uh, more cost effective than, you know, many other things is so, oh, some of the interventions that are often, you know, considered most cost effective are, you know, involve giving children things like bed nets, deworming pills, or some sort of nutrient supplementation. Um, but I think it's, it's quite possible that, you know, a parent, when they receive a cash transfer, um, the, the likelihood that they, you know, provide one of their, you know, uh, you know, kids with one of these, you know, items themselves, you know, increases some amount. How much? I, I think I would, I would also very much, you know, like to kind of get better evidence on that. But that, that's kind of this, uh, you know, motivation for being like, it, you know, cash transfers for the household can kind of trigger this cascade of other interventions, potentially. I, I've seen some evidence on this, but I, I haven't yet given it kind of the full meta-analytic treatment. Um, yeah, and, uh, and kind of as, as Laura, you know, said earlier, I, I think she, she covered, you know, kind of the, the ground way better. You know, there, there are, um, there are kind of ways we can do conditions that, you know, you know, are, are, are where we simply kind of like label cash transfers. And I, I think, you know, one of the next kind of, um, areas is to kind of like figure out the optimal conditionality if, you know, if it exists, um, and to try and kind of like pinpoint that. So that's all I've got. Thanks, Joel. Um, I think I always found the, the paradox of cash transfer schemes is that because they are one of the most highly evaluated type of intervention, uh, you know, it, it kind of creates this, uh, love hate uh, you know in, in a you know kind of relationship of you know let's you know it, it's easy to talk bad at all the things that didn't work from the evaluation point of view at the same time you know um you know the 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 the, the re, you know the reason they exist is because they're obviously you know have been doing a lot of good uh, around the world and, and it's kind of a, a endless effort to try to improve them so so in some ways kind of a uh, the last couple of questions, I'll, I'll start with Laura. It's also, you know, you alluded a little bit about this new generation, right, of thinking and going away from a very archaic, uh, economistic way of, you know, gift transfers, automatic people, you know, improve, et cetera, to, to also kind of, a, and a lot of what, you know, we heard from Dean, a lot of, a lot of the work right now, it's, you know, it, it's kind of the Christmas tree approach, but methodologically or systematic, right? Thinking through the complementarities, just like any intervention, right? You know, um, so, and I know you've done a lot of work around thinking about the issue of productivity and how that relates to cash transfers. So, um, you know, maybe, you know, I just want to ask you if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the role of behavior science in the design side of things, you know, you know, is, is behavior science role you think it's about making this connection some of it i think you all talked about the the you know the the mental model the the attitude the motivation that potentially can trigger lean you know the intergenerational angle uh what what uh, what are you finding from your work uh, laura thanks Renas. i i think this is a a really exciting area and indeed as we started this conference and <clears throat> with what dean carlin was talking about the work that that's been done, um, you know, that he's done with IPA and CGAP and the Ford Foundation, where they did that six country randomized control trials in each country and, and really um, looked at the impact of these cash plus programs that are these graduation models that are very much focused on 
the big questions, right? How do you actually lift people out of extreme poverty and, and can that be sustained? And, and I think it's so exciting to see some of the evidence coming out of that, that, um, that it's not just about, I liked this, about capital, but also about capabilities, right? And that it is important to look at the kind of constraints. And I think we've become very aware of this through pioneering work from Sendil Mulanate and Elda Schaefer and others that really look at what are those constraints on um, our decisions, on our intentions that come from situations of extreme poverty where, where you, you, know, you really have um, that, uh, that impact of scarcity, right? On, on decisions and decisions that are important for getting out of extreme poverty, right? You need, uh, you need to build assets, you need savings, you need uh, investments. I and mean, we had talked before about parenting and investments in human capital, but the, you know, the, the productive side of that with um, assets and incomes and productivity is, is, is another absolutely key question. And something that, that I take um, a lot of heart in and, and builds in this earlier work that, that Dean was mentioning at the beginning of the conference is that um, BRAC, which is one of the big NGOs that works on um, ultra poor models, they now have a pretty clear model with four components, right? One is the cash uh, and the income support. The other is around livelihoods and asset. The third is around financial inclusion. And the fourth for all of us is what they call social empowerment. And when you kind of look under the hood about, okay, so what is this social empowerment stuff? It is about, um, it's about behavioral interventions, right? It's about um, uh, building confidence. It's about building resilience. It's about using norms. It's about using um, coaches and uh, mentors and others um, to really support each other. And they are starting to find through systematic work because BRAC is now this massive global NGO, um, they're starting to find some evidence of this. And, and we're finding it as well through a lot of the work um, at the World Bank. So I actually see some of our collaborators from Ideas 42 and the Global Innovation Fund. And we have been um, supporting in Sub-Saharan Africa a number of um, interventions, behavioral interventions in cash transfer programs that are aimed at enhancing productive inclusion. And, uh, and I, I see one of our collaborators from Kenya, Mr. Gachigi, who has joined us today. So in Kenya and in Tanzania, where we now have results um, from some of these, uh, from some of this work, there's work also going on in other countries, but it's at an earlier stage. We see that having um, introduced low cost and scalable nudges um, around planning, saving and goal setting, actually is translating into um, changes in those areas around goals being met, uh, around savings going up, and that this is above and beyond um, kind of the, again, the, the influence of the cash transfers themselves. So I think this is a, a, very, um, a very promising area because it is, uh, it is the productive pathway um, out, of, out of poverty. So we need to understand how this works. We need to understand as, as we were talking earlier about the scalability and cost effectiveness of these models, but there's, um, there's a lot of promise there. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, so Frank, from your work, what, what are you finding in terms of, you know, how the role, you know, the link between, you know, mental health uh, specifically and, and productivity? Yeah, so let me return to the two points that I uh, mentioned above. So one is um, the study on the impact of financial strain on worker productivity. So really what, what we seem to find is like, you know, improving financial well-being can have important benefits for productivity beyond sort of, you know, consumption and other sort of types of, of benefits. And so, but, but really our, our study is like a proof of concept rather than a policy evaluation or something to scale. So that's to say, when you show that, you know, we, we show that paying workers earlier than, um, than others makes them more productive. But really what we don't know is um, uh, what happens in the long run um, and, and what's sort of the best policy. And I think that's really where we need uh, uh, more work. Because of course, once you pay some workers earlier than others, um, 
if there's a budget constraint and you pay everybody the same, you know, you, you have to pay them like later um, less than others. And, you know, if then there's some benefits um, uh, up front, maybe then there's some costs later. And the question kind of like, what's the best policy? And of course, the other considerations such as, you know, people might uh, have demand for commitments to savings, et cetera, and so on. So really sort of like testing the long run productivity um, uh, uh, consequences of different uh, uh, payment schemes um, in terms of like, directly varying um, uh, uh, when people are paid, maybe giving people choices when to be paid, giving people options to be paid when they're particularly strained or the like, uh, seems really valuable. And then trying to understand um, a sort of productivity benefits, uh, broadly speaking. And by that, I mean like worker productivity potentially as we measured in India, but perhaps also other things like, you know, are people applying for jobs? Are people able to help themselves in other ways? Um, uh, I think that's that's sort of where we're headed um, next. And then second, um, getting back to uh, psychotherapy or supplementing cash transfers um, with psychotherapy. So there, as I said, you know, there's a large body of evidence showing inexpensive um, therapies are uh, effective in improving mental health. And I wanna emphasize that these, these are often highly scalable in se several ways. So one form is sort of the in-person um, uh, therapy by non-specialists, often by peers, that are trained in very like um, a short number of days or weeks. And, you know, Vikram Patel and others, again, at Sangat and, uh, and a lot of other organizations have shown that these can be highly uh, effective in improving uh, mental health. And they tend to be extremely cheap and relatively easy to scale because you don't, you don't need a, a, a sort of a trained psychiatrist or, or psychologist. Um, uh, you, you need a, a, a lay person or like a non-specialist who's willing to, 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 to essentially help. Um, uh, and second, um, and this is sort of a little bit um, more down the line, but I think perhaps even more promising is online or phone therapies um, because they're extremely uh, uh, scalable. That's sort of taking off, I think, in the U.S. Uh, more and more. You see, you know, lots of uh, online opportunities for uh, psychotherapies, including, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy um, by a video, including uh, sort of just chatting with a therapist, but also including uh, uh, things like uh, chatbots potentially um, that are sort of like trained uh, uh, in uh, CBT or the like. I don't know about the benefits or the evaluations of the latter, but the potential is enormous in terms of like if somebody could figure out how to make this work, um, there's huge potential because it's extremely scalable and the marginal costs of these types of uh, interventions could be uh, uh, very, very low. And you might be able to reach like a huge set of people, which in turn then you know, would improve um, people's mental health, but then perhaps in turn also have some uh, uh, labor market productivity, et cetera, benefits. And there's some evidence by, again, Vikram Patel and co-authors on sort of like, um, you know, uh, meta-analyses on the effects of psychological interventions on people's uh, labor supply and the like, and there seem to be some benefits there. These are usually public health studies, so not necessarily measuring what economists would, would want to see, but I think sort of exploring those more um, uh, uh, seems really uh, promising and important. And again, I, I want to emphasize that sort of pairing these sort of, this is a, a different version of like a cash uh, a plus model where you might say, um, in addition to providing people with cash, you might provide them with some options for uh, psychological support. Now, um, the final point that I wanna make is that the key issue here will be, and this is very much like a behavioral science issue, I think is, is, is going to be take up. That's to say that, or take up and um, adherence in the sense that, you know, the, the people who might benefit the most from psychotherapy might be uh, the least likely to um, uh, take it up. And I think there we have to do a lot of work to try and figure out how to do that, be it in, in, in trying to uh, explain benefits, the benefits or the efficacy of these types of interventions to people, be it trying to do interventions to reduce stigma or, or, or any forms of uh, shame that people might be experiencing, um, or just perhaps, in fact, um, providing people some modest financial benefits to at least try out these interventions. Uh, that's to say, you want to be very careful not to force people to do uh, 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 things that they don't want to do. But if you provided them for some benefits to at least try out these interventions, uh, and perhaps then they might learn that this is helpful for them, um, that could be a reasonable thing to, to, to try, and that could be quite um, effective. Thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, we, we have three, four minutes. Uh, so I, I have a couple of questions. 
So, so briefly, I wanted to ask both Lisa and Joel around, uh, you know, bring back these ideas of technology uh, and how it can be used. Uh, All right, for, right, thank uh, you. And so thank I just wanted to quickly ask, you know, both of you, okay. uh, in terms of technology, you know, what, what do we think are kind of, a, you know, primed areas for behavior science to, to, to be used uh, kind of in this new generation of cash transfer schemes? Yeah, perfect. So I will pick up on a point that Laura made, and I guess I should be a little bit more optimistic about the U.S. setting because she's right. We are sort of at the potential beginnings of a new era here. Um, you know, I, I save lots of caution and skepticism. Um, and I think with that, technological, technological innovation is going to be super important because the U.S. actually lacks a cohesive, easy, universal system for distributing almost anything um, and certainly for distributing cash. And what we see happening in the next year and what we see happening with stimulus payments here in the US is everything is operating through the tax system. And um, I think most of you have at least um, probably experienced uh, filing for taxes in the US. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, and you know we see from the last stimulus payments that many eligible families indeed did not get it. They've changed some things, um, you know, non-filer portals and this kind of thing. But I remain um, uh, only cautiously optimistic that the tax system can really reach all families and individuals as intended um, with any kind of cash transfer. So, um, you know, I think the U.S. just needs a whole new system. Um, and I've been I've been engaged in a, um, a study. It's a research study, but the way that we're distributing cash to the mothers and families in our study is through a debit card, and the debit card is given. It's just a card um, that the, that's given to the baby upon birth. So you can imagine, can you imagine a scenario where every child in the US or every individual in the US has some format, whether it's a mobile format or an actual technology like a card that can uh, with the trigger be you know, put on or off for disbursement of funds. And that is connected with the financial system in which transactions can occur, which is the other um, challenge in the US system, right? So you have to be able to purchase um, items and use, right, the mechanism um, in a pretty um, unfettered way. Um, so there's lots of room for innovation in the U.S., and I think that it's happening in pockets. It is not kind of bubbled up to kind of a public and government investment level yet. Sorry, Joel, that was my probably one minute too much. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, for, for this, I would uh, just like to raise the, kind of the, the recent case of Give Directly when it partnered with uh, the Center for Effective Global Action um, in recently kind of just like providing, you know, near seamless automatic, you know, payments to people in Togo. And it did so by kind of, there, there was, it was, it was set up in such a way in which um, you know, recipients were, you know, there was like, uh, there was like advertisements on the radio to just like dial this number and input your information if you wanted to be eligible for cash transfers. And after they did that, um, on the back end, you know, like, uh, you know, G Give Directly and their partners had, you know, basically worked out, um, you know, this, this white list of, you know, people who they predicted to be in, you know, like very high poverty. And it seems like it's pretty accurate. Um, and so they, they'd already like pre okayed you know, certain people that if they opted in just by just by sending this text message that they would immediately get a cash transfer. And so I, I find that I find that as like a potentially kind of like exciting, you know, new work to really, um, you know, bring down kind of like the barriers to access where it seems like there's normally a lot more work that needs to, you know, be done in vetting, but you know, because they use like this, you know, satellite imagery. Um, and, you know, they, they, you know, predicted, you know, both from, <laughs> um, you know, both from the imagery and like people's like phone records, like who the people were at the highest risk um, that they could just, you know, automatically send them. And I, I find that, you know, uh, it's, it's very recent, but it's, it's, it's very, I find that very exciting. Thank you, Joel and, and Lisa. So I think I'm, I'm going to wrap up uh, this session. There was uh, one last question I wanted to put, uh, uh, to give like 15, 20 seconds. But I, I think what I want to do, I want to ask everybody uh, to put in the chat, you know, at some point, you know, now or when, when you're back, 
uh, you know, if you were sitting in front of a policymaker and you wanted to pitch about your favorite, you know, behavior science innovation in cash transfer schemes, you know, what would that be? Uh, so, you know, I'm inviting both the speakers and everybody to, to you just put that on the chat. Uh, and, uh, but as you see from the, the diversity of topics and discussion, you know, we can have probably an endless conversation around these themes. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Lisa, Joel, Frank, and Laura for an amazing and, and a really packed uh, set of insights that we've learned in 45 minutes. Uh, and, and I think with this, I want to do a virtual, you know, clap. And uh, I want to wrap up this session. And I'm, uh, we'll be back. I think we're on a break now. We will be back in 10 minutes. So the next session starts at 10.50. So, I guess with all this, back to you, Dilip, for the amazing jazz music. And see you all soon. Thank you, everybody. People experience homelessness on a given night uh, because of evictions, job loss, domestic violence, mental health issues, et cetera. And this presents a significant cost to the government. So every year, uh, it costs 55000 to 132000 per person to run social and health services. In the US, the, the situation is similar. Uh, on any given night, over half a million people experience homelessness. And this costs anywhere from 50,000 to $73,000 uh, per person per year to address homelessness. So the traditional approaches to homelessness have involved in providing emergency services like uh, shelters, uh, permanent housing, uh, or mental health or uh, rehab services. But um, we are piloting the first you know, trial where we're testing the power of unconditional cash transfers on alleviating homelessness. And this, as you, many of you, uh, you know, that cash transfers are an effective solution to fight global poverty. In developing countries, cash transfers have you know, improved uh, a range of the, uh, outcomes, including well-being, health, uh, financial uh, strategies, food security, um, as well as educational and employment outcomes. And in fact, a review of uh, 30 studies showed that there's actually a slight reduction on temptation goods spending um, after cash transfers. So our question is, how does cash transfer um, impact individuals experiencing homelessness? To do this, we gave uh, 7,500 Canadian dollars to each of 50 recently homeless individuals in Vancouver um, as a one-time unconditional cash grant with 65 uh, individuals as the control group. And the reason we chose $7,500 is that that was the annual social assistance rate in British Columbia back in 2016 when we finalized the design of the study. So we think that cash transfer provides greater financial freedom to empower people to exercise their own uh, control and choice over their, their life in order to propel themselves to move beyond homelessness. Uh, as an evaluation, we track outcomes in different domains for uh, one year at these time points, at one month, three months, and all the way to 12 months after the cash transfer. Moreover, we pre-registered uh, the study on Open Science Framework. So to do this RCT, we worked with the ministry uh, in British Columbia provincial government. Uh, this is important because uh, we reached agreement with the province to let our cash recipients keep the cash while still being eligible for income assistance and, and health services. This, this is to, to prevent the, the, the welfare cliff that uh, Stacia mentioned yesterday. Uh, so that our participants will experience no negative uh, impact on their uh, social assistance as a result of participating in our study. Once we have the agreement in place, uh, we, we open free checking accounts at Van City, which is local credit union for all of our participants. And we e-transferred uh, the cash amount, which is $7,500 to their checking account. We worked with four shelter organizations uh, to recruit participants across Metro Vancouver. And specifically, this is our screening criteria. Uh, first, we received referrals of participants from the shelter based on the first three screening criteria, which is just age between 19 and 65, must be homeless for less than two years, 
and must be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. And after that, we deploy a team of uh, interviewers to each to go into the shelters and to further screen on substance use. So our screening criterion there was they have to have non-severe levels of substance use, uh, non-severe levels of alcohol use, or psychiatric symptoms. So the percentages show that this is the, the number of uh, percent of participants who pass each criterion. And collectively, 31% of the participants uh, screened passed all criteria in our study. So total, we have 115 participants uh, who were successfully enrolled into the study. So 50 of them were in the cash group who, who received $7,500 as cash transfers, and then 65 were in the control group. Uh, we, we purposely conducted the screening survey uh, under a cover story uh, without any mention of cash. We just said this is the UBC well-being study. This is to ensure that the answers we get from participants were honest and truthful. Okay, so here are the results. We see positive Im impacts of the cash transfer on these domains, which I'll go over in detail. We see no difference or no impact of the cash transfer in, in these domains, which I won't get into due to time constraints today. So, look, so let's start with stable housing. Um, here I'm plotting the timeline from baseline to all, uh, all the way to 12 months after the cash transfer with the uh, cash participants and non-cash participants on this particular metric, which is percent of days being homeless. And we found that over the course of one year, cash recipients spend 88 fewer days homeless. And almost re re reverse to this result, we see that cash recipients moved, in, moved into stable housing faster. They actually were able to move into stable housing uh, at one month after the cash transfer, which is incredibly fast, given that the average wait time to get into stable housing if you're homeless is six months in Vancouver. So moving to stable housing, um, provide stability uh, that actually reduced risks of, all, of trauma and violence in our participants. And this can certainly help uh, increase health um, in our participants and free up shelter beds for those who actually need a bed um, in Vancouver. So this is an extremely promising finding uh, that we have. And this, this impact was immediate. It was actually within one month of the cash transfer. We further tracked spending per month uh, for each participant. And we found that cash recipients increased the spending at one and three months after the transfer. And specifically, they increased their spending on rent. This, this corresponds to the moving into stable housing faster uh, pat uh, pattern that I showed earlier. In addition, they also spend, uh, increased their spending on food um, at one and three months. And perhaps as a result of greater spending on food, more cash recipients achieved food security at one month. And moreover, cash recipients spent more money on uh, durable goods, so they include um, you know, furniture, computers, phones, etc. They also spent more money on clothing at one month, were able to replace a fresh uh, new a set of clothes. And importantly, we did not see evidence of increased spending on temptation goods. So this includes alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes. And if anything, there is a reduction on spending on temptation goods for cash recipients, and there's a slight increase uh, for control participants. And this, this challenges the widespread assumption that we hold for people under poverty, which is that when given cash, they will, they will squander it on temptation goods. And our data suggests that this is exactly the opposite. That's not the case. They actually reduce their spending, slightly reduce their spending on temptation goods. Okay, so um, this is data on savings, and this is perhaps not surprising. This is how much money you have in your uh, bank account. So cash recipients retain more savings at one and three months. Um, the, and, and actually overall, over one year, they retain more, more, more savings, uh, about $1,000 per month than non-cash recipients. So this challenges the assumption of uh, impulsive spending that cash recipients are actually uh, able to retain a lot of their savings over time. And they also showed the increased uh, uh, total, total assets. So this is basically the value of financial assets as well as belongings. Um, the total monetary value of assets increased for cash recipients. And this is consistent with a lot of 
uh, cash transfer results in um, developing countries. And moreover, we see that cash recipients were able to increase their hours, working hours at one and 12 months after the cash transfer. Also, they, they were able to increase their pay per hour at three and six months. So this suggests that they may have uh, moved on to a better paying or higher paying job after the cash transfer. In terms of cognitive function, this is executive function. We, we see that um, cash recipients improve their executive function at three months. Um, although their increase on subjective well-being was only temporary, it was only uh, at one month. Now, overall, we did a cost-benefit analysis to see whether the cash transfer generated savings for society uh, by reduced reliance on, on social services. And this is just looking at their use of shelter service system. And we found that cash recipients saved over $8,000 per person per year than non-cash participants. And this, is, this actually means that it, there's a net savings of $600 per participant per year as a result of the cash transfer. Okay, so here are the key takeaways. Um, just to situate the study in the context, we're working with the most impoverished people in one of the most expensive cities in the world with the highest rents and the lowest vacancy rates. But even so, we found that cash transfer increased the housing stability, spending, savings, assets, food security and subjective well-being at one to three months. So these are the immediate impact of a cash transfer. It also increased the executive function at three months and employment outcomes over uh, three to 12 months. We did not see increases in temptation good spending. Um, and moreover, cash transfers can be a cost-effective approach to reduce homelessness, at least in Canada or in, in Vancouver. So the policy recommendation coming out of our study was that we should, well, government should distribute $7,500 to individuals experiencing homelessness without severe um, sub substance use, alcohol use, or mental health symptoms. But then to implement this policy, we need to also address public perception. So we asked uh, a representative sample in North America this question. How much uh, would the cash recipient spend on temptation goods given uh, $7,500. And what we found was um, people think that if the individual is someone else, not myself, if the individual is homeless, then non-homeless, then they will spend more money on temptation goods. So that interaction you see here signifies a, a deep mistrust of how public sees individuals who experience homelessness. And then we'll further um, ask for people's public support, uh, for their support for this public policy that distributes the cash transfer to individuals who experience homelessness. And we found that framing matters, framing the policy matters. So if you say that this cash transfer uh, can reduce people's spending on temptation goods, increase and increase their spending on rent, food, and clothing, that's, that framing seemed to improve people's support for the policy. And also, if we frame the policy in terms of this cash transfer can reduce people's reliance on the shelter system and produce net savings for society, that also increase people's support for this policy. So we, we think that this policy could face resistance from public um, due to the, uh, the mistrust in, in the spending on temptation goods, but this can be mitigated by highlighting the benefits of the cash transfer in terms of reduced spending on temptation goods, will reduce reliance on the social services and generation uh, generating net savings for society. Okay, I wanna wrap up my talk by thanking my team again, uh, Ryan, Ryan and Claire, as well as the fund, our funding sources. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Dilip. Yay. I guess that's the bell that says that we have no more time uh, for questions. Uh, but unless uh, unless there is a burning question, I'm probably going to now turn it over to Shogato and Zena and invite Jiaying uh, to join them for concluding uh, comments. Uh, I remember yesterday a conversation with Zena where she said, "This is why I got into uh, into behavioral science. This whole cash transfer stuff." So. Uh, I suspect Zena has a lot to say, but Shogato, maybe I'll let you take us away and uh, see how best you want to use the last 10, 15 minutes of our session. 
Hi, Philip. Um, and yeah, I think it would be great to hear some reflections from people. I think we heard some of yours already. Um, um, maybe I'll, I'll kick this off briefly and then hand over to, to, to Zena um, and, and Jiang, and then maybe you can just wrap us up once more at the end with also any other logistical notes um, on the conference. So my reflections will be very brief, but I think one of the things I've been very struck by, and I think one of the reasons that holding this conference and bringing together, I think quite a diverse set of people has been so fascinating is, um, while I sort of already knew this at some level, but it's been very interesting for me to see how much um, the sets of people working in the developing, developing world can actually learn from each other. I think I mentioned this yesterday as well, that. Um, there's so much work that has been done in uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America, which is actually only now beginning to happen in uh, North America and actually know even less about Europe. Um, and it was, it was striking to me, I, I think Jen's presentation was fascinating um, and so clear in terms of the outcomes that you know, uh, the cash transfer of the homeless is contributing to. But you know, when I first started working on this stuff in developing countries, that was the work that Latin America had sort of done at that point, right? We had all of this evidence that people do not spend money on temptation goods, that they do in fact invest in the things that are important for their well-being and the well-being of their families. So it's great that I think North America is taking it seriously and is catching up. Um, and so hopefully the direction of travel will continue to converge in the sense that all of the things that we're now beginning to try in you know, in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America about different ways of delivering add-on interventions, um, ways to support people's decision-making will also make their way into the next generation of studies in, in, uh, in the US and Canada and elsewhere. So that's my kind of main takeaway. And I really just want to urge everybody who uh, participated, who, you know, we come from so many different backgrounds and so many different sort of entry points into this to really um, continue to be in touch and to continue to explore uh, ways in which these streams are working inform each other. Um, and so, yeah, that's it for me. Uh, Zena, did you want to go next? Sure, and thanks so much, uh, uh, Dilip and everybody for inviting me. It's, uh, as Dilip said, it's a full circle for me to be here after working, starting to work in cash transfer seven years ago and, and uh, being frustrated about the limitation of communication and changing behaviors. So this is uh, a great to be part uh, of the symposium and learning about the wealth and spread of uh, experiments and research being done in the field of cash transfer and behavioral science and the resources that are already available. So, so this is also kind of my biggest, my big takeaway is uh, um, my reading list has just uh, increased a lot thanks to the past two days, even though they were half days, but there's a lot of papers I need to get caught up on right now. Um, some of the interesting things I found um, is, uh, uh, is I liked very much the diagnostic uh, uh, done on the mobile payment and PESA and financial inclusion that uh, was discussed this morning, uh, just because, uh, you know, we do a lot of these diagnostics, we see what works, we look at positive deviance, but, you know, it's a great way to look into, when you look into the barriers, how those, uh, you know, the experience of those who bypassed the barriers and found a way to actually access the service. So that was an interesting, uh, you know, twist to see, to look at the experience from a different perspective and look for potential solutions that way as well. Not just uh, the positive deviants, but also those who actually have found a way to, to jump through the system. So um, just because it, it, you know, getting people to get the IDs and phone, you know, is, a, is a closing that gap is, takes a long time. Um, some of the things that were reinforced for me was the value uh, of, uh, and evidence of cash plus programs. Obviously, this is a, a huge confirmation bias here, um, as this is kind of what I was hoping to see, especially in the AFZ Uganda study and the discussion today with Laura and others about building and strengthening capabilities uh, through the cash transfer and uh, providing also mental health support. Uh, these are important areas for us, as uh, you can imagine, in a lot of the context we're working in, in conflict settings, uh, um, you know, there are uh, there is resistance towards uh, or stigma towards mental health and it's also the most needed so how do you deliver that uh, whether you couple it with uh, cash transfer uh, um, in kind services or through employment uh, uh, um, cash for work or even small grants so looking into safe ways of incorporating some of these add-ons including mental health interventions is something of huge interest for us and uh, another important thing is uh, uh, looking into ways of measuring psychometrics and well-being in addition to uh, as part of measuring cash transfer. This is also something we are uh, uh, interested in, especially in the conflict setting. 
Now, uh, just a couple of remarks on uh, maybe the next steps. And, uh, you know, uh, I think it'll be good to see how we can continue closing the gap between social protection specialists, implementers, and uh, research. Um, you know, I always think of the project lead, the, the implementer, as someone who has a million things to do, a lot of, you know, bosses, a lot of uh, challenges. And, and the bandwidth they have to, to read papers and uh, uh, really know the latest research is just you know, very, very, very small. So how do we make it easy for them to access the latest tools and, and knowledge so they can basically uh, um, use it to design better programs and, and implement them at the right time? So, so again, thinking of uh, you know, continuing creating knowledge products and, and, and building on the existing ones, such as the checklist, checklist that was developed by IDS42 and the bank on uh, using behavioral science to design uh, better uh, social protection and cash transfers in emergency. Um, one more thing also to would be interesting to, to look into is uh, behavior change targeting, interventions targeting policymakers and service delivery uh, uh, individuals. And this is where uh, not just looking into biases and inefficiencies, but also building their capabilities to understand behavioral science and understand how they could use that lens to continue um, evolving and improving their program. So this is a, a probably very aspirational to expect all government employees to, to have or designers to have knowledge of behavioral science, but I think maybe what is it that they need to know when they're thinking about service delivery. So this is uh, just a few points, uh, uh, so, so, Kato, so over to you and thanks again. Thank you, Zena, and I did want to say one more thing before I hand it over to Jan, which is um, something I didn't get to talk about, but sort of you know, did sort of emerge in some of the conversations over the past couple of days, which is we've heard, and this is just sort of in, in the realm of aspirations in the future, so I thought it might be interesting for this group, but, you know, what we've seen is a variety of ways in which uh, behavioral interventions of one kind or the other, whether around, let's say, framing or partitioning or allocation or planning, have been done in different parts of cash transfer programs, but I think we're yet to see a program that takes as much of this as possible on board and really tries to say, you know, if we took everything that we know from existing research and try to create a program that, you know, incorporated all of this in all the ways that were possible, how much, you know, would that do better than a, like a plain cash program and by how much and would this be cost effective? So just throwing it out there for this interesting set of people in case anybody wants to take this idea further, but that's something I think certainly all of us would love to see and uh, to work on if possible. Um, and, and thanks Zena for the shout out to the infographic and the checklists. Um, these are a series of resources exactly created for World Bank task team leaders to be able to quickly access the existing knowledge that's out there, but we would be happy to share them and they're available publicly on the World Bank website as well if anyone else is interested. But Jen, over to you. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, so I think the two days of discussions on cash transfers open more questions for me than answered questions for me. Uh, so my most questions surround the plus. What should be the plus? How do we know what the right plus is? And how do, how do we explain the differences in the effect we see from the plus program? So uh, let me start with an example. I did What I didn't mention in my talk was that we did have a plus arm in, in, in addition to the cash transfer arm. So we provided people uh, a workshop based on behavioral science and live coaching based on a lot of Dean's work and, and others' work uh, coming from developing countries. So the workshop, I think, Chicago, this is kind of relevant to the, the, the intervention you mentioned. In the workshop, this is one-on-one -on -one person. We provided self-affirmation uh, exercises, goal setting, plan making, even have them do a, like a mental accounting exercise to help them you know, budget the $7,500. Uh, so we did that with every party, every cash recipients, and um, and and coaching was kind of reinforced, uh, uh, just kind of a, a coaching act activities with our participants. This is both uh, cash and non-cash participants in our group, and what we found was coaching failed miserably. Even though there's so much evidence coming from developing countries that uh, life skills coaching can help, this actually provides additional benefit on top of cash transfer itself. But for our participants, uh, they did not follow through coaching. They dropped off uh, coaching <laughs> quickly. And uh, for those who, who kind of we can reach back, they, they said, 
I don't need to be coached right now. I, I, I need to find housing. I need to find food. I need to know how to do my resume. So don't tell me about aspirations. I'm not there yet. Um, and so, so I think for our kind of this, this plus uh, the behavioral interventions on top of the cash transfer, um, they've, uh, they mostly did not lead to any meaningful or significant differences in, in our data. And we're still trying to figure out why that's the case and how, how we can reconcile our findings with the existing body of literature on cash transfers. Um, another discrepancy I see was the psychological benefits of cash transfers was minimum, uh, if not short-lived. So we, 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 we hypothesized that the cash transfer should empower individuals, should give them more self-efficacy because this is, a, you know, kind of a, that's exactly why we designed the cash transfer in the first place. But in the very measures of self-efficacy and empowerment, we did not see any impact of the cash transfer whatsoever at any time. So why was that? We, 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 we were still trying to you know, figure out why that, what explains the null effect. Um, and despite the, I think the evidence again from a lot of other studies showing you know, empowerment uh, and self-efficacy boosts after the cash transfer. So I think these are just the, 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 the differences that we need to keep in mind as we design cash transfers with specific populations and different uh, countries or contexts. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going back to the, the cash plus model, which I think Dean and a lot of the movements and cash transfers are calling for. Um, I think we have to be very careful in, in designing these kind of in-kind supports and, and services um, on top of the cash transfer itself. Yeah, so I think that these are my final uh, reflections. Um, over to you, Shigato or Dilip. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, no, I think those are, I, I, I think we, we can't overstate, I think, the importance of tailoring all of this to context and to populations. I mean, it's right through that almost none of the evidence that we have from the developing world specifically looks at, for instance, people who have been homeless for a long time. I mean, that's a very different set of circumstances, uh, not just economic, but psychological and social, um, in terms of support systems, in terms of access to family networks, very different than the populations we're usually dealing with. In, in Africa, say, who may be much poorer, but who are actually are embedded within much more stable um, social systems and um, you know, support than we might have um, for a homeless population. So I think those are very, very important points. And the more we can continue to unpack this question of what's the right plus. And I think what, what Dean basically said was, you know, it's, it's never going to be like a universal answer. We have to say, what's the right plus for this setting? And we still don't need to know that. So the more we know about that, the better. So Dilip, over to you for the final, final last word. Yeah, I mean, all I have are quick logistic wrap up. So uh, one of our goals, obviously, in addition to sharing what we know and what we have done is to build a community. And to that end, uh, we'll be back in touch with everybody. We would love to be able to circulate a list of attendees, people that signed up uh, for this. Uh, so expect from us an email uh, asking you if it's okay to share your contact information. Uh, and if it isn't, that's fine. Uh, but you know, we will try and build that community in place. There is also a listserv. So we will send you information on how to sign up for that listserv. Um, that's a good anonymous way of reaching people and kind of staying in touch with, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with what's happening in this community. And, and as well, all of the videos and resources uh, from the symposium will be on the website soon. So please expect an email from us letting you know that they're up there. Um, other than that, it's been an honor and privilege. I think this is something that I've been passionate about. Uh, Zena was talking about six, six or eight years ago. I've been passionate about since I was a kid because you know I, I grew up in a place where I've seen the effect of cash and and and, and the power that cash can have on changing people's lives. And so um, my wheel has turned. It's taken maybe 40, 45 years to turn, but uh, but it's great and and and, and I, I love the energy in the community. But to to what Shagato and Zena and, and Jaying said, there are a lot more questions. Uh, but there is just a big universe of work out there. And so to the extent we can pull it all together, that would be fantastic. So that's it from me. Uh, we still have a minute or two. So in case anybody else who stuck with us to the bitter end of the symposium has anything to say, uh, let me just open it up now. And if not, uh, thank you all for being with us. Final comments, anyone?
Okay. Thank I, you. I think I think there's a couple. There are a couple hand raised. There's Ali and Liz. Oh, I had put the applause up ah. to thank you all. It was a really, really tremendous conference. Congratulations. I, I personally learned a lot and, and look forward to staying in touch and um, for the listserv and everything to come. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day, rest of the night, and, and, and an amazing week ahead. Uh, and we will be in touch. Thank you, Thank you, Thanks, everyone.